Welcome back everyone. So in today's video, I'm going to have a quick look at another library that I built. This one's to manage the serial communications. What I found with the robot projects was if I tried to send a lot of data out on the serial port at once, it would actually affect uh, interrupt routines and things like that causing all sorts of grief. So what I've done is created a class to manage the serial port communications such that you can dump information into the buffer to be sent and it also is a receive buffer and the actual communications works independent of writing and reading in and out of those buffers. So it allows the device to send and receive serial communications in the background if you like and I've also started to actually delve into the actual classes to show you how the code works. But anyway, let's have a look at it now. Okay, so this time we're going to look at a library I created called Timed Serial. First of all, let's just take a look at the GitHub site. Here's the actual Timed Serial interface. And again, there's a little bit of information here on how to actually use it. And what we want to do is download zip file. I'll just drag it onto the desktop. Okay, and we can now close that. Okay, so we'll start the Arduino application and under sketch, include libraries. What we want to do is add a zip library and we put that on the desktop. So there it is. And just choose that and that's would have put that in now. So now if we take a look under examples, and scroll down there will be a timed serial and serial test is the actual application we'll take a look at okay so the point of this class is with the uh, project that i'm working on at the moment which is the mono board i've got a state engine and it's processing states at a given rate, probably every 50 milliseconds. And I want to log some data out of the serial port. However, if I actually send a huge volume of data out of the serial port at once, what I find is it stuffs up interrupts and things like that, which I may want to use or will likely be using uh, down the track with the motor controller. So what I've done, I've built this class so that you can put information into the buffer that you want sent, and this is actually being executed quicker than the state engine. And you'll see how we do that as we sort of walk through this example. But the whole point is put the information into the buffer and have it get processed as it can and not adversely affect the interrupts. And the same with the received information. We can't afford to wait for information to come in on the serial port to get it. So what we do is we just grab every byte as it comes in and build it up into a buffer. And as soon as we see a carriage return, we assume that that's the end of that command and we make it available for the application to do what it needs. So it runs in the background and handles all the serial communications and lets everything else process at the speed that it wants to. So let's have a look at this example. First of all, we need to include the header file. The second thing we do is we instantiate it and we actually pass two parameters through and that's 100 and 100 in this case. That's the TX buffer size and the RX buffer size. And then you can select this to be whatever you need. It's sort of dependent on the amount of information that you're gonna burst out and how large the commands are that are coming in. This variable here is just to do with actually setting up the regime for generating some timed uh, functions that aren't running at the same loop time. It really doesn't have anything to do with this class. In the setup though, the first thing that we do see is this begin function. The begin function gets past the actual board rate that you want the serial port to run at. And that will set up the serial port. 
Again, the next line here is really all about just setting up those timed uh, functions. So when we get into the loop, this all this first top bit here is all about generating those timed functions. And here they are here, timed send function and timed receive function. And we're just going to use that in our test. So basically it's just checking to see if the loop time uh, minus the last time it was processed is greater than 100. And if it is, then it will set the loop time to do the last process time, run those two functions and all is sweet. And that 100 is actually milliseconds, so 100 milliseconds. So that's causing the time send function and the time receive function to basically get executed every 100 milliseconds. Again, nothing really to do with this particular uh, library. The thing that is important though is this last line here, which is the execute function. And that gets run every time through the loop. So as I said, we can put data into the buffer at one rate and then this execute will get called every time through the loop and it will actually process a byte at a time in and out of that serial port. And the thought process is it will actually stay ahead of what we're pushing into the buffer. Or at least the, the burst won't be so long that it can't clear the buffer out before it starts filling up again. Okay, so let's have a look at the two time functions. Let's have a look at the send function first. All we're really doing here is using the send on serial and the, in the first instance here, or the first use here, we're sending us some string data out. In the second line, we're actually sending out the long integer value of the actual uh, loop time. And again, in that third, we're actually using the send on serial ln and sending a string value and uh, also uh, making sure that it contains a new line character at the end of it, which automatically happens using that function. So that's the time send, fairly straightforward. That just puts data into that buffer for streaming out of the serial port. Let's have a look at the time receive function. So all it does is every time it's executed, it just does a quick check to see if the received data is ready to use by calling the is received ready function. If it's true, then all we're doing here is using the uh, serial port get received buffer to get out whatever we received. And we're just echoing it straight back out on the serial port using the send on serial LN. So it will just echo back on the serial port. So I've actually already got that running on the Arduino. If we open the serial monitor, we can see that that data is streaming out. And if we send some data, uh, send, you can see that that actually got echoed out in between that data. Okay, so let's take a look at what's under the hood of the library. If you go into the Arduino libraries folder, you'll actually find where that library's been imported to, time serial. And if we take a look at the files that are in there, the two important ones are the header file and the actual code file. So if we just open the header file, so the license at the top of it, and then the actual class definition. So we've got all the public methods here, and we've got some private variables that we've got set up. So let's take a look at the actual code. So first up here, you know that I'm working with the STM32 now, and there's a couple of libraries that are a little bit different there when compared to the normal Arduino. So when something's compiled against the STM32, they need to be added. So I'm using a preprocessor directive here to load the include file if we're actually compiling for the STM32. And then we start getting into the actual functions proper. So the first thing we've got is the initializer. This is called when the class is instantiated and it's basically just saving the buffer sizes off to some local variables and setting receive ready to be false. So just initializing things. Then we've got the begin function. And again, it gets past speed. 
and this is fairly straightforward it literally just calls a begin on the serial and then waits until it's actually created uh, next we've got the execute method so this is the one that's called every loop so we just initialize a variable for receive byte we check to see whether we're still getting characters or whether we've actually already got a line of characters in the receive buffer if we are still collecting characters then we just check if one's there if it is we grab it if it's a carriage return then we say okay receive ready is true else we just concatenate it to the receive buffer and then we look at the send function if the send buffer length is greater than zero so there are characters in the send buffer then we just grab the first character and we write it out in the serial port and then we remove that character from the buffer so it's just continually trying to send characters out on the serial port is receive ready it's pretty straightforward it literally just returns true or false depending on the receive ready and then get received buffer this is where we're getting the data out of the receive buffer so it does a quick check to see if receive ready is true if it is then it just grabs the data out of the receive buffer into a temporary variable sets the receive buffer to empty uh, turns off the receive ready and then just returns that string now if receive ready wasn't set then it will just return a blank string and then we move into the send on serial functions the first one is a string so first of all it does a check to see if adding that new string will take it above the maximum length if it will then it just changes the send buffer to this fixed string send buffer full clear contents new line just to let you know that it's actually happened because if it just cleared it out then at the end of the day you wouldn't know you've got a buffer overflow problem and then it just concatenates that new string into the send buffer and then we've got that function overridden for an integer just converts the integer to a string and then calls that send on serial with the string and then we have send on serial with a float so when you send a float you send it the actual float and you send the precision that you want that float sent at and this is why we need to have that i2a header file included when i looked at the string functions around floats it added a huge overhead to the finished program it was a ridiculous size difference and I tried various different ways just using the standard libraries and nothing seemed to work. So what I ended up doing was cutting this piece of code that actually converts the float into a string. It worked out being so much more efficient. It's not funny. Look, you can have a chew through that code if you want. I'm not going to go through it in this video. But at the end of the day, it's basically working out the integer value of each weighted number in the float and then converting that to a character and building up a string. And then we have the line functions. They just call the functions above and then add the new line character into the buffer as well. So nothing particularly exciting there. So that's pretty much the guts of the class. Okay well that's pretty much it for that library function as always if you've got any questions or any suggestions then please either leave a comment or contact me on facebook or via email and i don't know if i mentioned it at the start but i will leave a link to this project in github okay cheers for now if you like what i'm doing then please do like the video if you'd like to see more then please subscribe and don't forget to hit the chime so you get notified when I post something new. And I'll put a couple of links here to some other videos you can look at.